I'm with Kamiel Krutkov from Kids for Peace Jerusalem. Now, Kamiel, what is Kids for Peace Jerusalem? Kids for Peace is a youth organization in Jerusalem. We started back in 2002 when a Episcopalian priest by the name of Henry Kars came to Jerusalem. 2002 was a very difficult year. And he really just wanted to take the children of Jerusalem and take them out of Jerusalem to a summer camp. It didn't even start with any sort of big philosophies or anything. It was really very, very simple. And so he gathered 12 families, four Jewish families, four Muslim families, and four Christian families. And he had, they all had children in the sixth grade. And he took them to a summer camp in, uh, in North America. And they had a few sessions beforehand to kind of prepare and to get to know one another. And when they came back, the families wanted to keep on meeting. And so the kids kept on kind of meeting not on a regular basis, so usually about like once a month, maybe a little more, and Henry started preparing for the next group. And uh, that summer um, saw another summer camp. This time you had the seventh grade and the sixth grade, and it slowly started growing from there. 16 years later, we're now um, approximately about 500 families and working all over Jerusalem, where today it's no longer a third, third, and third. Today we have about 40% Muslim, 40% Jewish, and 20% Christian simply because as we're growing, the Christian community is very, is very small here. And there's still a, a larger number in our organization than they are in the general population. But uh, just because we were growing, we had to uh, uh, kind of change that. And yes, and we have programming now that takes place. Almost, I mean, every week there's programming that taking, pla taking place here from, we have a program that takes place from the sixth grade through ninth grade. It's all uh, their, their advisors that are running programs for the kids. Every single year has a different uh, educational theme. And from 10th to, uh, to 12th grade, the, uh, the teens come together right here um, in Sheikh Jarrah, and they, uh, they also meet here on a, on a weekly basis, and they are running programs throughout the city, various projects that they run throughout the city, and they're called the Youth Action Program. Our acronym for that is YAP. Uh, now, you say you started in 2002. What was the situation like in Jerusalem in 2002? Well, 2002 was probably the worst year of, um, of the violence that was taking place at the time. It started back in 2000, and in 2002, both on the Israeli side and on the Palestinian side, it was very, very, was a very, very, very challenging year for, for everyone. And that was essentially the reality that, that Henry kind of came into and realized that uh, it was very, very hard to have any kind of conversation and any kind of interaction when there was so much pain and, and so much violence taking place here. That was kind of the the beginning of the of the model of kind of taking the kids out of the you know out of their environment and and taking them abroad. Over the years, we actually uh, as things sort of kind of calmed down a little bit, we have done we have kind of changed our educational programming so that uh, the younger years no longer leave the country, and it's only the older eighth and ninth grades who actually go and do their summer camps abroad. The weekly programming takes place obviously here, and the younger summer camps also are local. When there's conflict on the ground, do you see the mood of the kids change? The conflict on the ground is uh, is always affecting the work that we do. I think that during the last few years, is there's rarely a time when there's not something happening. But generally speaking, we actually find that, and this has been very interesting over the years, that when um, things get very, very challenging, the our programs end up being very full. And it's actually when things are very calm that it's more challenging to bring people to the programming. And we kind of rationalize that, that... Um, this has become sort of a space where a very diverse community of Jerusalemites can come together and speak. And a lot of times when, they, when things are happening around them and there's a lot of violence around them, this is the space where they can actually kind of interact with the other, the people who are not them. And so yes, it definitely affects our, our, definitely affects our programming. Sometimes you see things that happen that will, um, that will, where people will not come to a, to a certain program. For example, um, this not long ago we had when, um, when Mr. Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital. We had that weekend, we had programming happening the very next day where we were supposed to be bringing about 200 youth from around Jerusalem together. We had programming for the older teens who were supposed to be meeting that weekend. And it kind of left a very big question mark as to what was going to be happening. There were many Palestinians who didn't come to that program. And it in itself created an educational opportunity to kind of have a kind of conversation with with the Israelis, who are their peers, why are your friends not here? What's happening? Because for many Israelis, they could not understand why it is even such a big deal, right? Because in the, in the Israeli mindset, Jerusalem is the capital, right? So how, and then suddenly it becomes, it's like, oh, 
there's another people, there are an, another group of people living here. They also have a very strong relationship with Jerusalem, and then it essentially opened up an opportunity for a very deep and meaningful educational uh, conversation. That weekend, we had the older program, the older teens that came for a weekend together. They all came, and generally, you also see that as the teens get older, they become also more committed to the group that they are that they are meeting with. And so, these situations that take place here around us affect them a little less, and they use the meetings as a platform to to share their feelings and to share their and to share their thoughts about what's happening around them what sort of projects do you run with the your kids so the programming um, as i somewhat mentioned before kind of divides into um to the younger youth which are sixth grade to ninth grade and then the older ones who are 10th 11th and 12th the uh, younger ones go through a sort of a process um, we when the kids first meet in the sixth and the seventh grade, the uh, educational objectives are about getting the group to become a cohesive group. We don't start talking about the challenges yet. We don't start talking about any of the any of the diff like the very big differences. They come up in the context of conversation a lot, and and the advisors uh, have to work with what comes up from uh, from the various uh, programming that takes place. Um, but generally speaking, it's going to be about getting to know getting to know each other's neighborhoods getting to know each other's holidays, various religious practices, understanding the families, what the families look like, brothers, sisters, you know, how many, how big the families are, what they look like, and kind of recognizing sort of the similarities and the differences as, as, just, as kids and getting to know one another as, as, uh, as kids and, and slowly becoming a, a sort of a cohesive group. And in the eighth grade, they start talking about comparative conflict. And that is, we don't talk about the conflict here. We are talking about conflict in other places, so that so they start learning about what's going on, you know, what happened, what's going on and happening in Ireland, you know, former Yugoslavia. Uh, they study uh, North America as well, and they and they try to understand conflict around the world and what's been happening. And then um, in the ninth grade is when they start to talk about narratives, and that is essentially the first time when the teens start to kind of kind of bring up their story, and we make it very very personal. When we talk about narratives, we're not talking about narratives so much on the uh, on the grand scale of the Christian narrative or the Palestinian narrative or whatever it might be. It's really about their story and the story of the teens themselves. And obviously, their identities as Palestinian or Israeli, their identities as Jews, Muslims, Christians, is going to be a very big part of that, and, there's, and it's going to be part of their story. And um, but they slowly start to, to hear like themselves telling their story and they hear other people telling their stories. And that kind of starts to kind of, uh, kind of, it breaks down this idea of each person has their story and the narratives and what kind of affects the narratives and so forth. When they come to the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, they all join into one group. I'll backtrack for just for a moment. During those years, there's summer camps that take place and the summer camps kind of bring together the yearly topic. And so the year, the most important uh, camp for all those years is, is the is the camp for the year nines after they've spoken about their stories and their narratives and so forth they go to washington dc and they meet their counterpart youth from other chapters in uh, in the u.s uh, so they're meeting jews muslims and christians who are american and they go on to capitol hill and they have conversations with various leaders about you know their stories and their reality when they get back they join what we call yap with it which is the youth action program 16 to 18 years old 10th 11th and 12th grades and these kids come together and they they break up into groups and they start seeing what is what do they want to fix in jerusalem various issues that are that are problematic for them and that they want to kind of engage with and try to essentially be the change that they that they want to see and so every year they take on different projects this past year they had they had a community garden that they uh, planted in uh, in the neighborhood of Abu Tor, which is sort of split right down the middle Abu Tor sits on the green line so half of, of Abu Tor is Israeli and half of Abu Tor is Palestinian um, and they created their garden right in the middle um, and invited the community to come and engage with them and uh, and create this community garden where people can can uh, um, interact. Another group dealt with sort of the, the uh, public engagement of the way people engage in the public space. So uh, one aspect of engagement in the public space and, and having all communities in Jerusalem feel comfortable is language. Language is a very, very, very big thing that kind of separates the people here in Jerusalem. And the, the project that the teens chose to uh, to work with this past year was with a the idea of, um, of having subtitles 
in the movie theaters. So currently there are no um, cinemas in East Jerusalem. All the cinemas right now are in West Jerusalem. So if you are a Palestinian living in East Jerusalem and you want to go to the cinema, you're going to go to a cinema. A lot of them are on, like we have a few that are actually on the green line, but you're still going to be going to an Israeli cinema and the, tra and the translation is going to be into Hebrew. And this project actually started from, a, um, from a, another program of ours. We take the younger kids to go and see a movie at the end of the year. And one year we saw, I think it was like Zootopia, and the other year after that it was Moana. And specifically with, uh, with Moana, when we went to see Moana, the kids were all sitting in the movie theater and the movie came on. And about half an hour in, we started noticing that, spe that specifically the, the Arab speaking children, were just, they disengaged, they weren't interested anymore. And we realized that it was because there was no subtitles. There was no way for them to really understand what's going on in the film. And so the older teens decided to take this on as a project and try to bring in Arab subtitles into the movies uh, here in Jerusalem. And they went on this long journey that took them to various distribution companies in Las Vegas and other companies and writing letters to people in the US who had no idea as to why it would be important for there to be Arab subtitles in Jerusalem. They discovered along the way that, it, that apparently uh, uh, Israel is under the, under the European distribution and East Jerusalem and the West Bank and Gaza are under the Middle Eastern distribution, so they have different languages that, that work with the movies. And so it was, it was a very interesting experience for them as they kind of went on this journey. And uh, we, their, their success is a small one, but it's going to hopefully grow in time with a pilot program that's starting uh, in September at the Cinematheque here in Jerusalem, where they'll have Arab subtitles in, in the films. So I just, that was two out of many projects that they that they're doing. They have uh, tours. They, uh, they also act as uh, the CITs, the sort of the counselors for the younger kids, and they celebrate their holidays together. They have, the older teens also have a project that, they, that we call the, uh, the town hall. Once a month, they decide who they're going to invite to the town hall. Um, that's not, the older staff is not, we just kind of uh, help make it happen, but they pick the people that they want to uh, hear. And those people come to the town hall and they, uh, uh, the teens get to ask them questions and, and hear about different things that are going on here in Jerusalem. And, and then afterwards, once they leave, they have, you know, they break up into groups and they have conversations um, about those specific issues. So for example, we had at the beginning of this year, we had uh, Rabbi Malki Or and Sheikh Riyad who came to talk about the issues on the Temple Mount. They were both very critical to trying to solve the violence that erupted on, up on the Temple Mount back in 2017. And they also brought in people from uh, various uh, political parties. And it's been very, very, it's been a very interesting year seeing who, they, who they're interested in hearing and what they're interested in talking about. And because they're the ones who are picking the people to come and speak about their, you know, what they're, you know, what they're doing is it's, it really is kind of reflecting what, you know, the teens interests and, and the issues that they want to be involved in. Now you work with children. Are you also working with parents? Is that important? Our work with the parents has been a very interesting one, and it's it's kind of fluctuated and changed over the years. The initial theory of uh, of our work was uh, the same way that children can get you to buy anything, maybe they can also get you to buy coexistence and diversity and whatnot. And uh, we realized very quickly that we were very wrong. The kids were coming home and having these conversations with their siblings and with their parents, and they were having it in a vacuum because the parents didn't know how to have the conversations with the kids. And so uh, we started bringing, we created a parents program that ran simultaneously together with the kids. So in like, so what would happen was you'd have the, the parents would come up beforehand, the parents would just come and drop off their kids and leave. And as when we started creating the, the parents program, the parents would drop off their kids at the program and then go into the next, the room next door. And they would have a program that ran along the sim, along similar lines to what the kids were going through, of course, with the parents level. So if we were talking about holidays or we were talking about uh, identity or we we're talking about community, whatever the topic that the youth were dealing with, the parents also had similar conversations. And we realized very quickly that that transformed our entire operation from, from just being a youth organization to being really a community. One example, I have uh, a really kind of somewhat of an anecdotal, <coughs> somewhat amusing story. I was running a program for the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had two girls sitting to my right and they wouldn't stop talking. And I would have silenced them immediately except that one girl was Jewish and the other girl was Muslim. And usually in the sixth grade, it takes them a very long, it, they're not friends yet. It takes them a while 
to uh, to start to engage. The language is a very, very big barrier. There's a lot of challenges that we have kind of bringing the group together and making it a cohesive group. In the younger years, there's still a bit of a distance between the kids. And so that the fact that these two 12-year-old girls were talking to each other and and like couldn't stop talking, I like I was kind of conflicted. Do I end the conversation? Do I and at a certain point, I realized I couldn't continue running the program with them talking to my right. And I said, uh, I said to them, you know, I don't, I don't know if you realize this, but um, the two of you actually live very, very close to each other. And she goes, and they look at each other and like, wait, where do you live? And one of them said, oh, I live in uh, in Arnona. And the other, and and the Palestinian girl says, oh, I live in Solbahe. And and they were like trying to figure out where the neighborhoods were, like even because they didn't necessarily recognize the names. And then they realized that they were very, very close to each other. And immediately after the program, the two girls ran over to their mothers who were in the other room. And they said, you know, we want, we want to play with each other, like outside of the program. And before, you know, up until that point, that has never happened before. Because you, if a Palestinian kid goes home to his parents and says, I want to play with my f- Jewish friend in his, the Israeli neighborhood, the parents would say, no way. And vice versa as well. If an Israeli kid goes home and says, I want to play with my Palestinian friend in the Palestinian neighborhood, the parents would say, no way. But suddenly something happened that the parents, the two mothers had been meeting, you know, a few meetings already in a row. They already knew each other. And so it was like, oh, your daughter, my daughter, okay, we'll try, we'll try to arrange something that will, that will work for both of us. And that was just one example, but it kind of, it really kind of spread throughout the entire, throughout the entire organization. It kind of really turned us from just dealing with youth to becoming an entire community. It enhanced the programs that we do throughout the year. We celebrate various holidays together. So we do an iftar and we have like a Christmas party and we have a Hanukkah party. And, we, and uh, the moment the parents became part of the story, they, uh, it really kind of changed the entire feeling of Kids for Peace. Most recently, the, the parents now have a parent board that has just very, very recently started. And so now the parents are also a an actual voice in how um, and how we run the programming and how we do things here. So, uh, yeah, the parents are definitely a very big part of our community. Are you making a difference in Jerusalem? That is a loaded question. <laughs> Sometimes I have this feeling that we're just a drop in the sea. And I go on this whole existential quest, wondering how much of a change we're actually making. Other times I will walk out of a program and I'll be completely like filled with hope, watching these young teens manage to engage in a way that nobody else seems to be able to engage with, like in a way that they no one else is. And so it's a it's a bit of both. I think we have uh, good weeks and we have bad weeks. Overall, we have a saying here that if you don't feel like giving up at least twice a week, then you're doing something wrong. So yes, there's definitely a lot of challenges and there's a lot of uphill. And what I, well, also like generally when we talk about education, it's not, it's not necessarily things that you can see happening, you know, right now. My hope is that we are creating the connections for future generations so that they don't have to become best friends, but for these young teens to one day become the leaders of their communities and they will be able to have a conversation in ways that th- the current adult world cannot have because they never had that experience of engaging and meeting and, and really getting to know another person as a human being is, and not just as a concept that's far, far away from them. It's very easy to demonize people that we don't know. It's very hard to do it when that person is very close to you. And so um, if we can create a future generation where there are teens that have complex and complex ideas about themselves and about, you know, and about the other and have a willingness to try to create these, these relationships, um, I think that hopefully we will see something and that maybe we, you know, only time will tell if we really made a big change or not. Uh, what's your website for people who'd like to know more? So the international website is k 4 p Dot org, and the Jerusalem website is k4pjerusalem.org.